Welcome, everybody. This is Internet Marketing Unleashed. I'm your host, Scott Patton, the Dean of Blogonomics and Pedology. Happy to have you with us. And I am so excited about today's guest. I've known him for, well, between three and four years. And as you may or may not know, I'm kind of living at slash from, because I've been doing a lot of traveling the last couple of years, on the west coast of Canada. And he is at what we would call the east coast of Canada. So we're separated by about half of the planet. Mm-hmm. And uh, fortunately, thanks to you know the technology and everything else, we've been able to uh, keep connected, be friends, uh, share lots of great information amongst each other. And I'm so excited to have him join us on the podcast. Now, when I first met him, well, when I was first exposed to him, it was on Facebook. And here was this fellow who was talking about podcasting and considering, I consider that kind of like my area. And I thought, who is this guy? So I, you know, I clicked on this and I clicked on that and I thought, wow, like he's doing a really good job and the sort of things at that time that he's asking about and wanting to do in his business looked like stuff that I didn't want to do. So I picked up the, uh, I didn't pick up the phone. I messaged him and started talking with him. And before you know it, there was a little bit of synergy. We did a course together on Udemy and he started moving into the coaching arena. And so it's been a, a pleasure for me to watch him grow in his coaching career. So I don't think I was there right at the beginning, but I was there early on. And to see somebody get success, to grow, to take their steps, to work through whatever issues that come up, because we all have stuff that comes up, you know, we may all see the bright, shiny lights, but believe me, there's dust that has to be cleaned up in every life. And it's just been a real pleasure. So the other day he posted and he said, hey, I've got a little bit of time between uh, Christmas and New Year's. And if uh, anyone wants to have me on their show, I'd be happy to. So message him right away. And here we are. So before I finish my introduction, one of the other things that I really appreciate and admire about our guest is the massive action equals massive results formula, and I guess it's the right massive action gives you the right massive results, because I know a lot of people do massive action, and they're totally heading in the wrong direction, but he is the epitome of that, so he didn't just do one podcast a month, he did one podcast a day, and he didn't do it for a week, and then say enough of this, because I don't know, you know, whatever my goals are, I haven't achieved it in a week, he still does it like three years later. And then people will say, oh, you know, you need to build an email list. And he didn't just put out one email a month or one email a week. He puts out an email every day. And he didn't do that for just a week and then quit. He's been doing that for years. And, of course, what happens when you do massive action in that way, you're creating huge amounts of content, is you get really good at it. So you may be saying to yourself today, well, I can't do that. I don't know what to write about or I don't know what to talk about or my voice sounds funny and all the rest of it. Well, let me tell you, if you do it every day for three years, you don't have any of those worries anymore, I am sure. Although we'll ask him if he ever has writer's block when he comes on. So Mark Mawinney, the coach's coach, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Scott. Time flies because I think we did our Udemy course in what, 2016? 20, I think it was 2016. Roughly, yeah. and I'm still getting positive feedback from it. So there's a good example. Um, full disclosure, my podcast is now weekly. So it was daily <laughs> for the first 300 days. And now it's weekly. We're approaching episode 600 as we record this. And But now with daily emails, that's my big daily thing uh, now. And I've been doing that for over, oh, it's been about a thousand straight days. Uh, where that that's I'm a huge fan of daily emails but yeah I, I think just like you with your Udemy programs and your students what are you up to 150,000 or 200,000 or something like that it, it's like eating an elephant one bite at a time right that's right that's right so I'm really curious about the daily what made you decide to do first the podcast daily now it's weekly and then the emails daily and I'm, and I'm assuming based on the what I hear from you is that that will probably continue yeah, well, yeah, as long as email is around, and I don't think email's on its way out, although some people say, oh, email's dead. No, email is not dead. <laughs> One of the advantages uh, coming from a background in real estate, which I did real estate throughout my 20s, so for about a decade, is it instills um, some really good habits, being disciplined, consistency, and so on, instilled some bad habits around work 
alcoholism too, which I'm still working around. But uh, my background in real estate really prepared me for this coaching because it's not a big, for years I called 20 people a day, you know, prospecting in real estate. So for me to do a daily podcast or daily emails, I just, I'm kind of like uh, the, the Terminator. I just go ahead and do it, you know, and um, like you got to be a machine in a lot of ways here with the online space. And here's uh, something that I'm finding a lot of people are doing is they're doing a lot of the right things, but they're not doing enough of it. So, you know, water boils at, I believe, 212 degrees. They're heating the water up. Maybe they're doing 150 degrees or whatever, but they're not reaching that boiling point or the tipping point that Malcolm Gladwell would say. And so the water's not boiling. And I make sure that's not going to happen because I'm, I say it's a Chinese water torture, but in a good way, <laughs> drip, 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 drip every single day. And eventually people will say, hey, I've been following you for years or months or whatever. And I give up. I got to buy your stuff here that you've been talking about. And let's do it. Yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. because, And I love the boiling water thing because I see it all the time. It's just like, well, I put a little bit of effort in. Uh, you know, they don't say they yeah. put a little bit of effort in. They put a lot of effort in, but I see a little bit of effort. And then it didn't work, so I'm off to the next thing. And yeah, a good example is this podcast interview. Like you mentioned at the beginning, I, did, I put feelers out there, uh, put a post out to my network, hey, I'm looking for interviews and got a ton of them booked. I'm now going to be doing consistent postings like that because it works so well. My goal is to get on 100 shows this year. It'll probably end up being roughly 120, I think about 10 guest interviews a month. Most people say, oh, yeah, I go on podcasts. Yeah, they go on one every two months or every three months. You know, they go maybe four or five a year. If they're going on four or five a year, I'm doing 100 or 120 like this. Who's going to get more their message out there more and get more business from it? It's going to be me compared to someone that does it just haphazardly. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And you you'd sort of mentioned the Udemy thing. And I guess here's what happens when you take massive action as opposed to dipping your your toe in is the prospecting ends up almost stopping right like mm. for you to be on a bunch you said okay i want to be on a bunch of podcasts i'll just put a little post on facebook and boom you've got 10 20 booked right i have 106 live udemy courses on all sorts of different topics and i don't try to find co-instructor like i do i work with co-instructors right mm. so i love yeah. to, you know i do a lot of the production end of it i do a lot of the directing end of it sometimes i'm on with them like in our course we're on together that's really fun but so a lot of times it can be a topic that i don't know anything about and so they're they're doing all the presenting mm. and i don't look for anybody anymore because i have so many people that are that are saying, Scott, I'd like to you to meet so and so. They're an expert on this, and they'd like to do some courses. And you're the only person I know that really knows what they're doing. Yeah, and that I think is something that I call it reverse marketing, right? Where you have such a good reputation and you're such a top of mind in your topic area that you're the ob like a friend of mine calls it the obvious expert, right? Yeah. So, you become the obvious expert and then everybody just comes to you and that there's no longer 20 phone calls a day looking for someone wanting to sell their house. Yeah. Well, when I got done with real estate, I said, I'm tired of chasing people. I want people chasing me, especially in the coaching world. If I have to chase someone and twist their arm, they're not in the right headspace. It's not going to be a good relationship. When they come to me and they're keen and they're eager, then it's much better chance of success. The cool thing that will happen, that's funny, we're, we're talking about this now, because just yesterday, I had a mutual, someone I know knows Michael Gerber from the E-Myth, nice. which that book has been mentioned probably more than any other book on my podcast. Probably that and Think and Grow Rich have been the big two that are always mentioned. And he said to me, hey, Mark, would you like to have Michael Gerber on your podcast? That's like asking a Kiss fan if they want to meet Gene Simmons or something. Right? <laughs> yes. I'm like, let me think about that. I, yes, yes, I would. He sends an email, my, uh, says, hey, Michael, meet Mark. Here's what he's doing with the show, blah, blah, blah. Michael said, yeah, I'd love to do it. Let's get it set up. Michael Gerber is now coming on Natural Born Coaches. Now, that wouldn't have happened, probably wouldn't have happened my first month of being a podcaster, but I've been at it now since November 2014. I've done almost 600 episodes, and it, just like you said, people coming into your orbit 
uh, that's going to happen. But you got to put yourself out there for those opportunities to come to you. And that's the important thing. You can't shy away and hide. And I find a lot of coaches and online entrepreneurs want to feel busy. So they tinker with the website. They're working on their logo. They're working on their banner, this PDF or whatever. And Thoreau had a quote. He said, it's not enough to be busy. So are the ants. The real question is, what are you busy doing? And a lot of online entrepreneurs are busy doing the wrong things. You're absolutely right. And there's no excuse for it because we have so many very talented people out there that are willing to do the tweaking the logo and fixing the website and all that sort of stuff. So, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but it's a very easy way because when you put yourself out there, you're risking rejection and you're risking haters and trolls popping out of the woodwork and it can be a scary out in the online space with billions of people potentially you know seeing you there so it's a very easy to say well I, I was busy today I spent 10 hours working on my website no you, you have to I say it's kind of like war in a way that the except the good stuff happens on the battlefield not the bad stuff you're not gonna you, you will get hit but you can't stay hiding in the foxhole you got to get out and you got to get onto the battlefield to get the good stuff that's right so one of the topics that we wanted to kind of uh, hit on today was starting a business on a shoestring so i'd like to start by asking you you're a very very successful real estate agent in the maritimes in canada I think you had quite a few people working for you in quite a large organization selling houses and stuff. Then you transition. What made you decide to get into coaching? Well, first of all, what made you decide to get into whatever you did next? Because sometimes it's not a direct line. And what was that kind of process like for you? Well, transition sounds much cleaner than it actually was. It was a forced transition in a lot of ways because I, I went through business closure. I went after almost 10 years of nonstop success and nothing went wrong no stumbles i went through not one but two business closures in the span of a couple of years and by then i was thinking you know what i'm burnt out from real estate i'm tired of it. i'm not having fun and i didn't know much about coaching but i found out about coaching being helped basically back to my feet by several coaches and mentors and that's what got me looking into it. And I thought, I knew I want to, uh, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I would go crazy work at a desk, nine to five, shoot me. So I said, I want to start a business, but I, it's not going to be in real estate. So what's it going to be? And I thought, hmm, this coaching thing's interesting. And that's where I started my coaching back in early 2014 because of that. And I can say that I'm much happier not to knock anyone that does real estate. There are people who enjoy it and all the power to them. I think life is not meant to be lived in the same box for 50, 60 working years. I started real estate when I was 21 years old. And I often said, if I'm 70 or 80 and lugging open house signs out in a busy intersection on a Sunday afternoon, that's not what I want to be doing. So you don't get pigeonholed. Don't be afraid to do different things in your life and mix it up a little. Well, let's talk a little bit. How do you start a business on a shoestring? Well, it's interesting because when I started my coaching business, I started it on a shoestring or a dental floss budget. I didn't have the resources that I had back in my real estate days because I lost everything, went belly up. And I thought that was a disadvantage in early 2014. I was thinking, oh man, if I only had access to the resources and the money that I you know, had back in real estate days, but it actually was a positive, believe it or not, because I, didn't, I wasn't sitting on a huge war chest, tens of thousands of dollars to throw into ads and funnels and hiring all these experts. So I had to roll up my sleeves and do the things like you mentioned earlier, like the daily podcast and the organic content and stuff to get my message out there. And I actually ended up being a good thing for me because it allowed me to hone my message and to craft it and to um, get more confidence with the message I was putting out there. I see a lot of people, I'm sure you do too, that leave corporate life. They got a cushy severance or they're sitting on a bunch of savings and they think, oh, I'm going to go pay 25 grand to hire this funnel guy and pay 30,000 in ads here and all this stuff. And they can't make it work because they think, Oh, I'll just throw money at it and wait for the leads to come in and not saying that it can't work, but I think there's something to be said for building up organically from the ground. And that's why my whole thing now, my, I say elevator pitch is I help coaches get more clients without paid advertising. You don't have to throw tons of money into ads. If you don't want to, you can make it work organically. Cool. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think sometimes when we 
when we transition from one type of business or career to another, it can be really an eye opener in terms of personal growth, right? Like I managed a grocery store mm -hmm. for 20 years and, you know, for 19 of those years, I was pretty sure it'd be a 40 year plan and I'd retire. And when I got halfway through it, I started looking at people 10 years older than me and realized like, wow, like they're ready for a heart attack or they're having <laughs> breakdowns and it's just yeah. such a grind. Right. Yeah, that's right. Or they might get canned. That's a grocery store pun, but don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the growth that occurred was really pretty amazing for me as I went through it because there was, I tried this and I tried that and I tried this and I tried that. And everything was like a stepping stone to where I am now, even though it didn't necessarily look like it at the time. Yeah. And as things evolved and like, I mean, I started with the podcasting, if you go back just that far and now it's, it's far more into online video courses. And, and, and it's funny because you're a grizzled veteran of the podcasting world. When was it? Oh, five or 2006. Yeah, you started here. So this is a funny thing. Now I have people talking to me and, and they go on like on some notes or Domus or something. I, I predicted this great boom. Oh my God, you're so lucky you got into podcasting in, from way back in 2014 the funny <laughs> thing is when i started in 2014 i thought i was too late to the party i was looking at um you know john lee dumas with entrepreneur on fire i believe he started in 2012 and then i looked at people like you back in 2006 i thought oh man i missed the boat here so i guess the lesson from that is just get started now there's never going to be a perfect time it's like the chinese proverb the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago the next best time is today that's right um, i have a friend here in, in the maritimes and his family owns a waterfront cottage on a beautiful uh, peninsula here in new brunswick and his father was a school teacher he bought this 800 feet of water beautiful water frontage beautiful property in the cottage you bought it in the 60s for roughly i think it was ten thousand dollars or sorry eight thousand dollars everyone thought he was crazy what are you doing buying a piece of land in the middle of nowhere and teach your salary for eight thousand dollars well as you can guess it's even in new brunswick we're not quite british columbia but it's worth a heck of a lot more than that now so i i went to tour the property with him before i, I offered to buy it from him i said i'll sweeten the deal i'll pay you 10 times what you paid for it he didn't buy it <laughs> <laughs> but the key is to get started with it don't get too hung up on what other people are doing and stuff just get started and get rolling and uh, you know i i there's people jump into podcasting in 2019 great you know it, yeah. it, it, you've probably found this too with podcasting you to meet everything everyone jumps into it but it's that top 20 percent that just stick with it and keep going there's so many podcasts they're on life support they're um in podgatory they call it instead of purgatory where they're you know they haven't released an episode in a long time so it looks like it's a crowded market space but very, relatively few or a small percent are actually serious like you and i putting them out consistently yeah that's really true and the other thing is a lot of times people say well you know there's too many well you talked about the crowded market space and i was thinking about that before when i was thinking about what are we going to be talking about and there is an insatiable appetite for content. Mm. Like if there's anything infinite in the universe, it is humankind's need for content because it just seems like it doesn't matter how much content is out there, it's not enough. And places like HBO and Netflix are the proof of the pudding. Like they don't bother releasing a new show one uh, episode a week. They have all at once. And then there's this thousands of people or millions of people that watch the whole nine or 15 episodes in one sitting or two sittings. And then they turn around and say, okay, like, let's have some more. I can't wait. Exactly. And I don't watch a lot of TV, but I'm guilty as charged. I have binge watched. Uh, I just finished Ozark. Great show, Jason Bateman. So I binge watched two seasons of Ozark. Uh, with it but netflix is very smart too even that little um, when you finish one episode in the bottom right hand corner the next one starts in five four three two one one little move like that gets people hooked because if that didn't have it people would have to go back to the menu and pick the next episode and all that other stuff very smart way to do it yeah it really is so uh, you know part of our message today is you have something to say because you're alive and you're on the planet, you've had a lot of experiences that can help other people. And you've had, you know, everybody has 
and dark times in their lives where they didn't know if they could succeed, if they say their business failed or their marriage failed or something else failed. And your experience and what you learn from it when you take time to kind of, you know, dissect it becomes information that you can then leverage to help other people if that's what you want. Yeah. One, one thing I will say is important is um, that you mentioned there's so much information out there for a lot of people it could be like drinking, uh, take a sip of water from a fire hose. You know, you Google anything, you're going to get 1.2 trillion results in a fraction of a second. I do think it's important nowadays that you have to differentiate yourself. You have to find out what makes you different than all the other people. So for example, I found my business really took off when I took the filter off and just started telling it like it is. I didn't sugarcoat it. I didn't try to play in that mushy middle, not offend people. Now, as I've gotten more more polarizing, I've also gotten more heat, but on both sides, that's a better way to do it. Because when you get people who are attacking you, then you get your fans who are rushing to your defense. And I've taken the approach, like there's a great movie, Warren Beatty called Bullworth back in 1996 or 1997. And I, I won't give the whole synopsis. Basically, he's a politician that decides to tell the truth. Really crazy concept, right? <laughs> With no, no political spin or whatever. He just literally says the truth with it and then uh, he ends up uh, catching on he kind of goes viral really and you know a, a lot of crazy stuff happens I said what if you took the Bullworth approach with business so perfect example you mentioned about me coming on here obviously I want to share a message I want people to get something from this and can help people who never buy anything from me great now would I be disappointed if somebody checked me out and hired me from hearing me on Scott Patton's podcast. No, that's what I want. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a capitalist. I want to make money. I like money and I want to help people. I can't help people if they don't hire me. So saying something like that, people will be, oh my God, he admitted that he wants to get business from going on Scott's podcast, the horror. Because <laughs> everyone pretends, all the online entrepreneurs pretend they don't want to make money. They're doing it to make the world a better place and it's all sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, and especially the coaching world. I call them Mother Teresa coaches. You can't charge any amount over pennies or you're greedy and you're in it for the wrong reasons. Rant over, sorry, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is, and it's a huge problem. It's, it's really obvious in the coaching world, but I think it's also a real problem in a lot of other categories, a lot of other areas. Where people mm. they they've got us I don't know if it's a financial thermometer and they're used to you know uh, 58 degrees and being slightly cold all the time and if it gets up to if, you know if their financial thing gets up to 75 and it's really really nice they'll do something to sabotage it and get it back down to 56. I blame Hollywood because if you look at almost any how many movies do you see where the bad guys the evil capitalist who's um, the rich guy, right? I, uh, they paint the the hero as the poor in it for the right reasons. Like a good example, the Spider-Man movies, the one with Tobey Maguire. Uncle Ben says something like, may not be rich, but at least we're honest, he says to Peter Parker, <laughs> right? And the bad guy's Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, who's a billionaire and rich as can be. And of course, he's evil. And that's why you see it now with this democratic socialist stuff and capitalists are evil and all that and it's really frustrating and i try to repel those people if they don't want to make good money they're not my ideal client and mm -hmm. i try to draw people to me that want to make a lot of money make a lot of impact be happy and uh, and that's a way to do it you reminded me of mr burns in the simpson been running yeah. for 30 odd years and he's the you know <laughs> trying to block out the sun excellent Excellent. Yeah, well, it, it is. If you um, you have to pay attention, but I catch myself. You mentioned Netflix, and why well, I love movies, but I have my radar up because there's such anti-capitalist stuff that's out there that makes it sound like making money is bad, right? And um, yeah, these Hollywood celebrities that are praising socialism and how great Venezuela is and all this other stuff, they made all their money in capitalist Hollywood making hundreds of millions of dollars in these movies, right? So yeah. you do have to watch to be brainwashed. And I'm not saying it happens just one side. I think there's brainwashing left wing, right wing all over the place, but you do have to keep your radar up for it and keep your eyes open. You make a really, really valid point, and, and I think a really important point, because there are all these influences on us, and if we're just like la -di -da -di -da going through, and the influences are coming, we're getting buffeted, we're no longer 
let's say, in control of our lives. In other words, I have this goal I want to go to, but I'm headed off this way because of all these influences and I never get to my goal. And I think that we have a purpose in life or a goal in our heart or our soul that we came here to do. And we know that on maybe a subconscious level, but when we're going in the wrong direction, that's mm -hmm. when people are really unhappy. They're dissatisfied. They want, they know they should be going over here, but they're going over here. So that's why they numb it with alcohol or drugs or pot or whatever it is that they, they end or watching Netflix with pizza, you know, those sort of things. Right. Yeah. And uh, if you don't think that's true, I want to tell you about a little story uh, about a hundred years ago, this couple had a baby and they, for some reason, they also had a monkey and they thought, huh, it would be interesting. We're going to expose the monkey to our baby and see if the monkey can become like more human. Right. And so after a few weeks, they stopped because their baby was becoming more and more and more like the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we get influenced very, very easily, a lot easier than people think we do. Yeah. yeah. You know? yeah and it's a lot like speaking of animal metaphors and stories. You've probably heard the elephant one when they're baby elephants, they tie them up to the wood pole right so they don't escape or whatever and then later in life they don't even have to have the, like that elephant could rip a pole out easily right it'd be like a toothpick for them but because in their mind they remember not being able to escape as a baby they think they can't do it and we put all sorts of limits on ourselves it's something that um we all want to conform we don't want to stick our head out too much right above the in canada we have the tall poppy syndrome which is often <laughs> said or crabs in a bucket many of those other things we want to be like everyone else i look at how the majority of society is i'm like man i don't want to be like them you know most that are miserable going to jobs that they hate they're in relationships where they're miserable they just hate their lives and they're trying to make it to the end and then they die <laughs> no thank you yeah you sort of wonder why well i guess you know I was going to say, you sort of wonder why they don't die sooner. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then we have a high suicide rate uh, in a lot of places too. So I, let's let's not go there. Let's mm. get back to starting businesses sure. on the shoestring. So if you're going to start today, knowing what you, what you know about what you've done in the past, or you were working with a coach who was just starting out, what would be some of the things that you would advise them on? Well, I mean, the first thing you have to do is determine who are you selling to, who are you helping, right? Your industry, your niche. In my case, if it's coaching, okay, who are you helping as a coach? And I'm not saying that you do a year's worth of market research because I think some people hide in market research, but you can do simple things like checking out Quora, Reddit, all these places, see what, what are keeping people up at night for whatever challenge it is that you, or what, like you, for example, you, I know you've done some stuff in the fibromyalgia world with your Facebook group and stuff like that. That's a perfect one. If you're a coach, you want to help people with fibromyalgia, get into groups like, like that Facebook group and other ones with it. Then you're, you're doing what Gary Halbert called feed a starving crowd. You're giving them what they need, what they want. Uh, with it so that's the first step but then you have to find a way to actually get clients obviously <laughs> and i always say it's better instead of doing 100 different things and bounce all over the place find just a couple things that you enjoy doing and that are effective so for example for me i got three pillars or, or legs to my stool i've got podcasting that would be my show natural born coaches and going on shows like this so i've got podcasting i've got facebook and especially the facebook group the coaching jungle and then the third one is email marketing, daily emails in particular. So if I'm doing podcasting, the Facebook group, and daily emails, I know that I'm fine. I'm good. But I don't try to get into Pinterest and uh, all this other stuff, right? I stay in my lane and I, I make sure I focus on that. So it's kind of like starting a fire. If you had a magnifying glass and you're moving it all over the place, it wouldn't be resting in one place enough to let the beam come down and catch on fire. You keep it on one spot, you have a better chance of getting the fire going. That's absolutely right. And as you were listing off your three, I was thinking, yes, and, and someone else might want to do YouTube if they really enjoy yeah. it. Video. Theirs are probably different than mine, but I would say stick to three. Uh, Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, said if you have more than three priorities, you don't have any. So if you have 20 different things you're focused on, that's not good. That's right. It's not, it's not going to work. And, and the other thing you have to resist in this is your buddy saying, oh, my God. Instagram is just like taking off. You should jump on Instagram. It's just like, yeah, 
uh, yeah, okay, so now that's four. And then the next buddy says, Facebook pages are really yeah. good and that's five. And then it's, uh, you know, LinkedIn is really good for your, you know, like it's like, oh. Uh, it, it's yeah, I mean, overwhelming. Uh, like, I'm on Instagram, but I'm, I'm not doing as much on Instagram compared to other places. Now, if I was an attractive younger female, <laughs> there would be right. I'd be squeezing as much orange out of that juice on Instagram. I'd be posting selfies of me and doc, doc lips and everything all over the place. But me, I'm not as uh, photogenic to go on Instagram. People don't want to see me doing doc lips and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but all the power to the ones who can are really good. All kidding aside, if you're good with pictures, especially if you live in a place, you're in California, you got beautiful beaches or your place with all these scenic stuff go for Instagram and do it. You know, us in Canada, you're in the California of Canada. I'm on the East coast where God, we get 10 feet of snow for a good chunk of the year. Instagram for me, I'm not feeling it as much. I prefer to stick to other things, but you, right. you find out what works for you and, and what you're good at, what you enjoy, and then do it consistently. I would say if I were starting over again, now this is, you know, 2019 looking at, it, I would probably do daily Facebook live video, for example. Every single day, I would be going live at, at a certain time, and bang, there you go. So there's an example of something you could do. It doesn't have to be podcasting. doesn't have to be daily emails, although I think they should look at it. Yeah, that's awesome advice. And I suppose if you're starting off right now, one of the things that you would recommend is that you get a coach or a mentor who's done what you want to do so that you can avoid some of the pitfalls. Yeah, definitely shortcuts it. Uh, one of the things I always tell people when I'm working with coaches is I had to figure out a lot of my stuff by trial and error. Even though I did have some help, there was a lot of throwing spaghetti at the wall, figuratively speaking. And uh, when I'm working with clients now, that's one of my big things. I want them to avoid <laughs> some of the things that trip me up as well. So I have some people say, no, that's not coaching. That's a combination of coaching, consulting, you know, the coaching snobs or whatever. I'm like, I don't care. It's helping people. And a lot of coaches think you can only ask questions. They get the answers inside and it's somehow um, not, you shouldn't be helping people that way or whatever. I'm like, I don't care. As long as I, I think coaching, my definition is helping people get from point A to point B. I don't care how I get them there. I want them to get from point A to point B. You brought up a really good point there, Mark, because before podcasting, I was uh, managing a group of coaches for the Internet Marketing Center, so 2003 to 2005. And it was interesting because we had a program. They would have you know, a number of clients. They would call them up once every week or two weeks or three weeks, and they would go through a coaching session. And we had this process that we wanted to take them through. You know, you need to decide on your business to get a domain name, get a website up, you know, get a product made, all these things that you needed to do. Yep. And a lot of them basically followed the book. Hmm. You know, today is week three, week three is the website. Tomorrow's week four is paid advertising. And, you know, and they had the uh, least happy clients, hmm. right? And what I would do is I would just say, okay, like, what do you want to accomplish? And we would work on just doing what you said, accomplishing what it is that they wanted to accomplish. And oftentimes, like there was no plan. I'd just be say, okay, like how was the last week? What did you get done? Uh, where are you? Did you get sales? Did you get this? Did you get that? And I found that, it, I just found it really interesting how some people as coaches need to be really, really structured, mm -hmm. which wasn't necessarily what the client needed. And I was like, well, okay, where do you need right now? And where are your problems? And what do we need to fix? And, and I didn't have a really an agenda. I had an area that I could go to, but most of the time it was like, what do we need to focus on for your business? As opposed to, uh, you know, while it's week three, we got to talk about getting into yeah. But And you have to be a good listener. So sometimes something will come out of left field that you pick up. I remember a session I had with a client once the words that we use matter. We don't give much thought to our words. Humans spit them out, right? And he said a couple of things in that session that set off the radar to my spidey senses. I would, um, we'd be talking about something, a certain uh, uh, strategy that he wanted to put into play. And he said, well, yeah, I'll try that. For example, try. Uh, so I had to put on my Yoda hat, do or do not. There is no try, you know, things like that. But little tiny, um, I don't know if weasel words is the right way, but weak words that he would put in there. We're shooting him in the foot. And I said, you, you have to be careful with um, 
you know, the, the words that you're, I suppose, and I'll try and we'll see and stuff like that. So that's not putting you in the right frame of mind going into this. So he wouldn't have picked up on that unless he had another person listening. Right. And that's the advantage of having a coach is regardless of how good you are, how motivated, how accountable you think you're keeping yourself, having a second a set of eyes or ears, looking at your situation from a ways like right now, if you were coaching me, I would get a lot from that because you're looking, I'm trapped in my body. I'm too, very close to the situation. You aren't right. And I'm sure that I would have some ahas that you would point out to me. And that's a, the benefit of having a coach. Excellent. That's my way of getting a free coaching session. I say, okay, let's go ahead, Scott, give me some free coaching. All right. <laughs> What's your problem? You, talking about some war stories, I have to share one of mine. Okay. So I'm working for a company, so that's a little bit different than being mm. on my own, right? And I had a client that I would have fired if I was on my own because he would come to the session. He'd be all excited, happy, be really interesting, like, oh, man, this was really great. And I'd say, okay, so what you have to do, we agree. These are the three things you got to mm. do for the next session in two weeks. And go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next session in two weeks, not done. Mm. Next session in two weeks, not done. And I'm getting frustrated because nothing's happening, but he's happy because he's learning some stuff and everything else. And then I realized he's not ready to mm. do anything. I mean, he's got all these other things going on, but he's fascinated by internet marketing. Mm. So I turned to him and I said, listen, we have a problem. You're not doing the work. And he goes, you're right. And I says, but you're enjoying our sessions. Mm. And he goes, you're right. And I said, so I think what you really want is you want an opportunity to learn. And he goes, well, yeah. And you're not really ready to implement. And he goes, oh, yeah. I think he's agreeing with me, right? He doesn't really want to say that. Yeah. He's agreeing with me. I said, so what we're going to do is we're going to switch. And I'm not going to coach you. He goes, oh, I'm going to teach you. Oh, because mm -hmm. you're interested in all this stuff. We have this two binders of information. And this is the process that we take people through. And I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to go over each section with you for an hour. Because we had like 12 sessions. And you're going, to, you're going to be exposed to all of it. You've got the book. You can review the book when you're ready to actually do stuff. Because I know you've got all these other things going on. Mm. Then come back to us. And I'll be happy to coach you through the process so that you've got everything done right. And the copy's right. And you're this and all the rest of it. And yep. he was ecstatic, right? Because he was feeling bad. You know, who wants to get on the phone? call with somebody and say I did nothing in two weeks yeah you know and if it was a, like if it was me and it was my business I would have just said look it's you know obviously this is not right for you now because you've got all these other things that are higher priorities let you know come back when it is right but yeah you can't tell my boss I just <laughs> fired a client <laughs> well well there are a lot of coaches who are afraid to call them the client out on their excuses like you that you called them out on it but a lot of coaches would be thinking well they paid me a lot of money I really don't want to make them feel bad they won't be my friend <laughs> People hire you as a coach, not because they need a friend. If they want to go grab a beer with someone, they can go with a local buddy, right? They're not yeah. hiring you to be their friend. And it's difficult because I'm the type of guy, I'm not the type to scream and yell and, and stuff like that. But I have had to crack the whip, so to speak, at times and call people out because if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're just wasting their money. And I have let clients go before like you have as well because I'm like, look, it's just it's not happening here. And you can't carry them over the finish line. If they don't want it, I can't want it more than they want it. And I used to think, here's a mistake I made in my early days of coaching is if someone was only 75% motivated, I would think, okay, well, I'll put in 125%. We'll even it out. <laughs> then I'll carry them over the finish line. doesn't work like that. They, ha they have to want it. Yeah. yeah. This is all about boundaries, right? Like you need to decide in your coaching business, like where are your boundaries and what are the expectations for your client? And then stick to it because nothing destroys your confidence and your self-esteem and everything else than having people walk all over these boundaries that you've set yeah. and having clients that are not successful. Like, you, you know, like I work with a real estate investing teacher. So he, he coaches people on how to invest in real estate. And 
I watch his eyes when he's talking about one of his successful students. Hmm. And then I watch when he talks about one of his, you know, students that's not doing anything. And the difference is like night and day, right? Like we get such a charge out of helping people and seeing them become successful. But we don't think about the opposite of that, the drain of our energy and everything else when we're working with somebody who's not really wanting to do it. Yeah. And it's not fair to your other clients. If you have one client who's draining you, then that's going to take away what you're giving your other clients. I recommend that what you mentioned, uh, get really specific who your ideal client is. Michael Port in his book, Yourself Solid, talks about the red velvet rope policy, where you treat your business like the hot new restaurant or nightclub in town that has the big 400 pound tall bouncer with the clipboard at the front. Right. Not just any Tom, Dick, or Harry can walk in. You need reservations. Could be months in advance. And, and, they have and he looks at you when you come to the door, and if you've got flip-flops and a scruffy T-shirt and a cap yeah. on and three days of you know beard, you haven't showered, and you know, <laughs> in, right? Yeah, so I did this years ago. I came up with a few criteria. So, for example, with mine, first of all, like I touched on, I want clients who are motivated. They're action takers, so they can't be someone who procrastinates, dithers, doesn't take any action. That's a big one. Another one is they have to uh, have big goals, so not to knock someone's goals, but if they have tiny little goals. For me, with coaches, I've had prospects before talk to me, and I say, what's your magic number? How much do you want to be making a month for from coaching? And this one woman in particular was a retired teacher. She said, well, I'd be happy if I made $500 a month, play money. That doesn't excite me. So that's not my ideal client. She, We're not a good fit to work together. I want to be paid what I'm worth and on time. I don't want to send Vinny with a baseball bat to British Columbia to find Scott and get my money, right? <laughs> so things like that. And when I came up with that criteria, I looked at my existing list of clients and I ranked them all on the five, I had five, and I still do, five piece of criteria. And anyone who didn't have at least four, I cut off. And there were a few. They had to have at least four, and any of them that were four out of five, I was going to talk to them and, and get them to see if we could get them to five. But now I make sure that, okay, they have to be a five before I take them on. And the odd one will sneak through. They trick me because you think they're good. They're a five out of five with one of the early conversations, and they end up not being. But for the most part, I've been pretty good with my radar and detecting who's not a good fit. And it's really important that you've got that criteria because if you didn't have it, you would be having all these zeros coming in. And yeah. you reminded me of, of around 2001, I was building websites. And I'm not, was, I'm not gonna say I was very good at it because I wasn't, I was just starting out. But mm -hmm. I, what, I was really frustrated with my clients. And so and I went to another website and they had, our clients and I looked, clicked on it and they had this list of who their clients were. I thought, this is really good. So I made my own list and I put it on my website and forgot about it. And over the next three or four or five months, my clients all shifted and changed. And yeah, I remember you telling me this story in one of our conversations. I think a woman's like, oh my God, that's me. You know, and she's yeah. reached out to you or something. Yeah. I, I went, well, actually, I was talking to one of my clients and I said, you know, you're my ideal client. Like, I love you guys. And they said, we know. <laughs> well, when we started, you know, thinking about whether we would work with you or not, we went to your website and you, you had this thing about clients and we looked at it and we read the list and we said, well, that's us. So yeah. <laughs> they were pre-sold. Now, what do most online entrepreneurs do is they use the fog and mirror test. If the person can fog a mirror or if they have a pulse, great, come on in. I can, you know, we can work together. That's right. And I think you have to get beat over the head with some bad clients before you get to that point. Sometimes, The earlier you can have your ideal criteria, the better. Yes. But I'm not pretending that right, right out of the gate, I didn't have it. Now, I had a head Nor start. I. Yeah, in my real estate days, they helped me doing real estate for a decade because there are certain things I wouldn't work with homeowners who are overpriced. Where I wouldn't work with unreasonable people, we'll say <laughs> a holes or b words. I would not work with them, stuff like that. So I have years of experience weeding out bad real estate clients. So when I started coaching, I was probably ahead of other new coaches because of that. But I still had some work to to do. I had a client once. He was a really nice guy. Don't get me wrong, but I call him my "What About Bob" client. Remember that movie with Richard Dreyfuss and Bill Murray? Yeah. He was like Bill Murray's character, Bob. 
And if he sent me a message, if I didn't get back to him within like five minutes, he would be hyperventilating and freaking out. Like, and I'm thinking this isn't what I'm looking for. You know, I don't want somebody, if I don't get back to them within a few minutes is uh, having a panic attack. So I let Bob go <laughs> in that case. I don't want a what about Bob client. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it takes a few really bad clients before you decide, you know what, it's not worth the pain and the anguish and the frustration and everything else to deal with someone who's not, particularly in a world with 7 billion people. Yeah, I, I had a great lesson uh, that I learned from one of my, uh, an agent in my office for real estate, a successful agent. This is when I was a newer agent. And we were, we were golfing, four of us, one day. And he was getting ready to drive and he checks his phone. He had a call from the office and he was talking to his assistant and he said, oh, okay. Hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, I understand. Okay. All right. I'll take care of it. So he calls, <laughs> it, I'll tell you what happened on the other line, but he calls up who was his client. He said, hi, I was talking to my office. They said, you called, uh, we're going to cancel your listing so you can pick up the key. It'll be at the office and you're free to list with another agent. And then you could hear the guy. No, well, if, what had happened was he called the office. She said, he's not available. He said, he better call me within two minutes or I'm done. You know, I'm going to fire him and all this stuff. And he just, the agent took control, basically said, I'm letting you go or whatever. Then the guy was begging not to do it. Well, no, I didn't mean that. I just want to blah, blah, blah. He said, no, it's okay. Um, I don't want to work with you. All the best. So he hangs up the phone. He walks up and then he just strike, uh, drives the ball. Now, I'd like to say it was a 300-yard drive right down the middle and he eagled the hole, but that would make it a cool story. I don't remember how the drive was, but I was very impressed with how he handled that because he just let him go and then went back to golf. And I thought, wow, that's a great way to run your business. That is an excellent way to run your business. So, And that's really good you know, because that becomes the what is the dream, what is the picture, what is the final you know, when you've made it, what does that look like? Which is another yeah. thing that I think people, when they're starting out, they just, it looks like like one client. I just want a client, please find me a client. It, it's such a confidence killer. If you're working with a bad client, I used to have them back in my real estate days where I worked with some, 99% of them were good, but there was the odd nasty one that just you're, you'd see their number on your phone. And you're like, oh God, not them. I'd rather poke my eyes out or, you know, set myself on fire and then talk to this person right now. And I don't want to feel like that. Like life is too short to be feeling like that. And so don't take on clients just for money. It may look good at the time, but every time you do that, a little piece of you dies inside and you don't want to do that too much. So don't take that, on bad clients. That's really, really true. Don't take on bad clients. We talked about influence and how we're constantly being influenced. When you take on bad clients, the influence is, it's like it's, your good clients have a 1% or one influence and the bad ones have a hundred because it's this huge weight. And I kept a client for 10 years because I really believed in what he was doing. Mm. The way that he behaved towards me was nothing I did was good enough. Oh, I yeah. sometimes think that, you know, and I had some friends that said, you know, you should let this guy go. And I said, ah, yeah, but I really believe in what he's doing and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And he's gone now. And it's just like, and anchors, you know, let yeah. go, right? It's just, I, I haven't had any nightmare clients in coaching, which is strange for the number of people I've worked with in five years. And I've worked with one or two, like I mentioned, that were my, you know, ideal clients. But in real estate, one of the things that always bugged me is people would, um, they would think they could treat you like crap because there's 300 agents in the marketplace and they think, oh, I'll, commission salespeople will lick my boots to get a commission or whatever. And that always bugged me uh, with coaching. If I ever had someone, for example, say, call me in the next five minutes or you're fired or something like that, I would, that's what I like about this. I would actually tell them to go pound sand and probably say a few other choice words. Back in the real estate days when I was working with the brokerage, they would call the manager. And if you ever said that and would you know, hey, Mark just said this to me. And I, I did at times when I'd have to defend myself when someone's coming at me and then they'd go complain to the broker or the manager. And I felt, this is stupid. Like you, you're expected to be treated like garbage. I'd have the manager say, well, you can't, you know, do to stand up for a client. We know you're in the right and they're in the wrong, but you can't do that. And that always bugged me. So I like with this is if they ever want to talk to my manager, great. <laughs> here he is. He's right here. It's me. <laughs> go after yourself. Go. <laughs>
that's the beauty of working for yourself yeah. and having your own business and being the boss, right? It, it is. It's a it's a, a feeling of freedom and control which I never had before, uh, and I it back in my real estate days, and I love that. Like I love that I could tell a client, "No, I don't want to work with you. You should go find someone else." And it's just it's a great feeling that way. So, not trying to say it's all sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, but. I can think of very few businesses or things to be doing that are this fulfilling and this, this amount of freedom and income potential and everything else. I just, I think it's a great business. If you're in coaching or a variation of that, with the online world, I mean, it's, it's great. Cool. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day and joining me and sharing all of this amazing information, particularly for people that are looking at coaches or starting a new business. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, uh, how can people get in touch with you if they're looking at maybe starting their own coaching business or their own business and they need a coach? Sure. So the main website is naturalborncoaches.com, not naturalbornkillers.com. You won't get me. <laughs> naturalborncoaches.com. Or the Facebook group is at thecoachingjungle.com, thecoachingjungle.com. As of recording, we have almost 16,000 coaches in there. Lots of good stuff being shared every day. I am in there popping in and out through the day. And it's for coaches, aspiring coaches, or people interested in coaching. You don't have to be actually a coach today to be in the group. But lots of good learning and, and stuff going on in there. So that coachingjungle.com. Awesome. Before we go, do you have a little tip you want to leave for people that are thinking of starting their own business or starting a coaching business? Oh, boys. Well, one tip, which I think is really important, is um, do, the, as we touched on before, do the things that you enjoy doing. If you absolutely detest doing something, it makes you break out in hives or want to throw up, delegate it. So I have a team of VAs in the Philippines. I know you work with um, people overseas with your Udemy editing and stuff like that. Very reasonable pricing wise. They handle a lot of things like admin for the Facebook group and stuff that I shouldn't be doing. And uh, you don't have to start with a full-time team, just even if you hire someone for a couple hours a week to do the things you absolutely hate, but get used to delegating and letting go because part of the problem with entrepreneurs, and I struggled with this for years, we're lone wolves who think we have to handle everything ourselves. We're the best person to handle it. And we're afraid to get our paws off any task we grasp onto. It's kind of like Charlton Heston with the, the guns out of my cold, dead hands. That's how we're, we're at. And entrepreneurs end up doing things that are like the five, ten dollars an hour tasks that they should not be doing. So start delegating stuff. The first thing I delegated was my podcast editing. And when my uh, twin brother, Matt, started his business, I gladly handed over podcast editing because I hate editing podcasts. I'd rather get a root canal. And then I uh, brought on VAs and all that other stuff. And, and it's freed me up mentally and, and energy and everything else. So that would be my tip is let go of the things you don't want to do. Get some help. That's an awesome tip. And uh, I had managed stores with 300 employees. And when I left, the last thing I wanted to do was delegate anything. <laughs> and it took me a long time to get over the trauma and I'll tell you, this is an amazing tip and really right on. Delegate as much as you can. Work on your business, not in your business. Yeah, the world won't end. Although you're, it's going to feel like it'll end if you hand off a task. But after a while, you'll be thinking, oh, geez, I should have done that sooner. Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate you. And I'm so happy you're in my life. And I enjoy our interactions a lot. And everybody else who's been listening in or watching, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate you and if it wasn't for you this wouldn't be uh, nearly as much fun i was just talking to myself and i wouldn't like that so till next time build your business everybody bye-bye